Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to be having a Sunday Shear, and uh, the Sunday Shear has been brought to you by the YBT Hashkafa podcast, which uh, every, I feel like every month I find new people who, in the community who don't know that it exists. If you don't know that it exists, you should now know that it exists, and that the main reason to use it is because when you pause a Shear, you can come back to it in the exact same place. And it's available on all of these podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. I think what we do is we put the main shirim, like uh, the Sunday shirim and Rabbi Vader's Kuma shirim on there. So I would recommend that you uh, you get that if you use podcasts. Okay, so the title of today's shir is Sporno's Counterintuitive Take on Corbin Pesach and Makas Pohoros. Uh, I tried to time this so that it would be at Parshas Bo, but it didn't really work out. And I also spelled Bo wrong here. Um, uh, but um, this is going to kind of span like the whole Yitzhak Mitzrayim thing and a little bit of uh, Bamidbar. Okay. Uh, I gave this shear originally two years ago to the day on uh, January 7th, 2022. And this shear is developed a little bit more than that version was. Okay. So, um, first of all, some words of. Uh, advertising <laughs> and uh, and thanks. So again, I highly recommend this edition of Sporno, the two volume uh, Rabbi Cooperman uh, uh, version, which has amazing footnotes. Um, and he links you to everything that you need to know. Um, and uh, great commentary. Then, uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, their Alha Torah has published, thanks to the generosity of Rabbi Moshe Kravitz, um, a commentary on all Torah called Shiure Avadia Sforno, which is notes taken on the Sforno's Shear live by his Talmud, Rabbi Elia Dinola. And what it essentially is, it's like it's like a director's cut of Sforno's commentary, where you will see the same idea said in different ways. You'll see additional ideas. Uh, and when I asked uh, Rabbi Moshe Kravitz, uh, you know, whether this person is reliable, he said, not only is he reliable, but the most up-to-date Sforno um, ideas are written in Elia Danola's commentary. So in other words, the, the the latest versions of the Sforno's ideas are written here. So th that is available on almost all of Chumash uh, and on many of the other books as well, like Tehillim. Okay, um, so three objectives today. Number one, main objective content-wise is to understand the events of the Leil Tesva of Nisan, the night of the 15th of Nisan according to Sforno, okay? Obviously, there's many ways to understand it, but this is going to be a Sforno-oriented cheer. Two, this is something that I guess is a background goal in general with my Sunday shirim, but uh, this one's more explicit, is I want to develop this understanding beyond what I prepared in the shir, utilizing the brain power of all the fingers in the room. Um, I, I, Every time I've come to this, this is now the, I wrote an article about this, which I never published. Then I gave a women's shir, and now I'm giving this shir. And every time I've given the shir on it, it's progressed a little bit more. So any you know, insights you have, I know you're going to do this anyway, but any insights that you have beyond the scope of the shear, or even any questions, then please ask, uh, because uh, this is like a constantly evolving uh, area. And number three is my own agenda, which is to convince people to learn more Sforno. Okay. And I spoke about this last time. I mean, this is the second Sforno based Sunday shear I've given this year. Um, I, I decided really quickly before shear to outline the eight reasons why I like Sforno and why you should too. One is it's shot oriented with support from Midrash. So as is not, it's not a secret. I am more of a fan of Pshat oriented Mepharshim than than uh, than Midrash. But he utilizes Midrash to eliminate the Pshat, uh, which I know is what a lot of Mepharshim do. But he does it in a way where it's very clearly mid, uh, Pshat oriented, and he'll just bring in the Midrashim that are uh, are are assisting that. Two, um, you know, I don't like these labels, but if you're going to label him, you would label him a rational or philosophical oriented of the Mepharshim, not one of the grammatical ones. Three, he's non mystical and non kabbalistic. Um, and those two are not necessarily um, like um, mutually exclusive. For example, Rabina Bafia ben Asher has a lot of rational ideas and philosophy in his Pirush, uh, and also Kabbalistic ideas. Same thing with Ramban, same thing with Rashba in his Agadita. But Sforno is, uh, I've never seen him say anything. I don't think he considered himself a Kabbalist. He was also in Italy, and uh, Kabbalah had not taken hold there in the same way as it did elsewhere in the world. Four, he's clear but concise and easy to read, as opposed to, let's say, the Abravanel, who's clear and not concise, okay, or the Rashbam, who is concise and not always clear, okay. He's very clear and concise, and you can read him without that much uh, trouble. I think people who are on the elementary, or I guess a, uh, uh, you know, non-advanced Hebrew level can access him. Five, he always has a fresh take on everything, and that's kind of sometimes what I'm looking for, just a fresh take. Six is he has a, he's dependable for having a comprehensive understanding of the sugya, which is consistent throughout his writing. So for example, 
Um, sometimes let's take the Rosh bomb as an example. You can get one comment from the Rosh bomb on a certain incident, but that's kind of all you have sometimes. You have one comment to work on. Or let's say Rashi, you have Rashi on Fumash who says something, but then let's say Rashi in the Gemara or Rashi in Tehillim or Rashi on Avos. Maybe I just don't know Rashi enough, but I don't get the sense that you can like look at all Rashis everywhere and put together a comprehensive understanding. Whereas let's say the Rambam, you can do that. You know, Sforno is in that Rambam camp. Is that all of his, every time I've looked at a Sugi in the Sforno, uh, it, it's all consistent. Seven, and this is the fun part, is it's fun to do the detective work of following all of the different clues and then putting together understanding. So, you know, you don't, there's certain Mepharshim like the Malvin who has great ideas, but he's like spoon feeding you. It's like listening to a shear, which is great, but here you get like the, the fun and the enjoyment of the learning because he's just concise enough to like tantalize you. And then you know that there's always good ideas at the end. And then number eight is he wrote a lot and much of it is intact. Um, as opposed to, let's say, Radak, you know, wrote on Breshis, but he didn't write on the other books. Or Avram and Aram wrote on Breshis and Shemos, which are great, but we're missing like much of his Breshis commentary. Last word of note for methodology, um, the the Sporno, the Cooperman edition is the Chumash one that you should use. Um, the translation by Repelkovitz, which I, I didn't bring the Chumash one, but he also has one on Avos, is the good one to use. You should know that the translations of Sporno on Al Hatora and Safaria they're not bad translations. They are not even translations. Rabbi Eliyahu Monk, who has a lot of translations, Beshita does not translate. He paraphrases and puts his own ideas into it. And you can read this in interviews with him. So if you think that it's a translation, it's not. He will omit large swaths of things. He will interject other material. He won't translate literally. So do not rely on that as a translation of the Sforno. If you want Rabbi Eliyahu Monk's ideas, I'm sure you can find good ideas, but it's not a translation. Repelkovitz is the best translation. And then you also have the Kisve Ovadia Sforno by Mosad Rav Cook, which has all the other works. Sforno wrote a more Nevuchim. I, a lot of people don't know about that, uh, or Amin, which is going through many of the same questions as the Raman uh, on philosophy and Aristotle and, you know, a lot of writings there. And then again, al Torah has many, many, um, you know, they put out the Pirkei Avos, which this is uh, on chapter four. He has seven pages of commentary and then 14 pages of footnotes that link you to all the other areas in the Sforno. So I highly encourage everyone, if you're looking for like an in, you know, we just started Safer Shemos last week. If you're looking for an in to like, you know, spice up your learning, Sforno is the way to go. Okay. Having said that, our year is going to focus on two classic questions, okay? These are not new questions. I hope they will be new answers. The two classic questions are, number one, who carried out Makas Bohoros? And two, what is the purpose of the Korban Pesach? Okay, now, um, I, you know, I've given this year before, and I also have asked a lot of uh, different students, okay? Um, so what would you predict is the most common answer to question one of who carried out Makas Bohoros? Hashem. Okay, right now, Hashem. Why, where do you get that from? The Haggadah, okay, right? So in the Haggadah, I think because most people, for better or for worse, are more familiar, probably for worse, more familiar with the Haggadah version of the story than the actual Pesukim. So it says on the drasha of Arami Ovid Avi, on the phrase, V'yotin Hashem uh, Mitraim, Hashem took us out of Egypt. Um, I'm going to do what I always do in Sunday Shirim. I will read the English that I translated here, but the Hebrew, if you want, I can send this to you. Not through a Malach, not through a Seraph, not through a Shliach, but a Kadosh Baruch Hu Bichvodo, Ramam just has Bichvodo, I think the standard Ashkenazic one has Bichvodo Uva Atzmo, uh, but HaKadosh Baruch in his glory himself, as it is stated, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from man to beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will enact judgments, I am Hashem, then it darshans, I will pass through the land of Egypt, I am not a Malach, and I will smite every firstborn, I am not a Saraf, and all against all the gods of Egypt I will enact judgments, I am not the Shliach, I am Hashem, I am here, no other. Okay, so common answer, Hashem himself did mock us before us. OK. Um, and what would you say if you asked people what was the purpose of the Quran Pesach? And I don't mean what was the philosophical um, theme. I mean, functionally, in the narrative, in the events, why did they do Corbin Pesach and what would happen if they did or didn't do it? What do you think the most common answer is? From Machas Bechoros. From Machas Bechoros. Okay, right. Machas Bechoros was going on, and this was to save them. Where do we get that from? Probably the Haggadah. Okay. It says, when we explain the Pesach, this is from Ram Gamliel and the Mishnah, the Pesach sacrifice that our ancestors ate during the period when the temple stood. What is it for? Because the Holy One, blesses, he skipped over the houses of our ancestors in Mitzrayim, as it is stated, and you shall say it is a Pesach sacrifice before Hashem, who skipped over the houses of the children of Israel in Mitzrayim when he struck the Egyptians, and our houses he spared. And upon hearing this, the nation bowed and prostrated themselves. So basically, common answer, 
we commemorate, so, okay, sorry, I guess our Korban Pesach commemorates Hashem skipping over the houses of our forefathers during Machat Pechoros. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and um, what was he saving them from? He was saving them from the plague of Machat Pechoros, seemingly, okay? But I feel like people also have some sort of like weird notion of like, maybe he was saving them from something else, you know, because what was the other commandment that they, what was the losa say that they got in terms of like location on that night? They can't go outside, right? So like, well, what's up with that? You know, and that was not just for the Bukhoros, it was for everybody, okay? Okay, so the the way that this, um, because I guess uh, I'm living in the 21st century, the, the way that this uh, inside dawned on me was a, a classic meme, okay? The Morpheus uh, meme. What if I told you that the Korban Pesa had nothing to do with Makas Bukhoros, okay? As I was reading Sforno, I realized that he seems to hold that the Korban Pesach has absolutely nothing to do with Makas Bukhoros, which sounds astonishing. Because even if we have all these little like glimmers of like something else is going on, I think we would feel like there's something that has to do with Makas Bukhoros. Okay, and I'm going to try to convince you that he holds has nothing to do with it. Okay, so let's dive right in. Okay, so there is a problem with a common answer to the question one of who carried out Makas Bukhoros. Uh, so the common answer is it was Hashem himself. Okay, so does anyone know, I guess, uh, a problem or at least a question, difficulty with that answer. Right. So there's an open pasuk, okay, which I'm going to read through, and I have it color-coded here. The yellow is all of the things that God is speaking of in the first person, and then uh, blue is referring to some other entity. So this is Shemos 12, uh, Pesukim 12 through 13. I shall go through the land of Egypt on this night, and I shall strike every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from man to beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I shall mete out punishment. I am Hashem. The blood shall be assigned for you upon the houses where you are. When I shall see the blood, I shall skip over you. There shall not be a negif lemashris. Okay, so hold that thought in your head. When I strike the land of Egypt. But the next psukim later on in the chapter, 22 and 23, are the key ones. You shall take a bundle of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. And as for you, you shall not leave the entrance of the house until morning. Hashem will pass through. I should have done that in blue. Hashem, no, no, I shouldn't have done that in blue. Hashem will pass through to smite Egypt. That sounds like it's Hashem. And he will see the blood that is on the lintel and the two doorposts. And Hashem will skip over the entrance. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your homes to strike. So it sounds like that from Pasuk Chav Gimel, that there is a mashkis, a destroyer. And Hashem is permitting it to enter, but it's not Hashem striking uh, the firstborns himself. Okay, that's what it sounds like. Now, there is a more sophisticated uh, problem with the notion of Hashem doing this plague himself, more philosophical, uh, which I'm not going to go into, but I think we should just have a nod to that. Philosophically, and I don't know if this is just according to the Rambam, but I know the Rambam talks about it. What, what would be, if metaphys maybe metaphysical is a better word, what is a metaphysical problem with the notion of Hashem doing something himself? Yeah? Right, is that Hashem interacts with the visible world through Malachim, with the physical world through Malachim. Mm. I think Rambam discusses this in the parak about um, angels, how angels, he says, at one point in the morning of Uchim are, uh, the idea of Malachim is like the second most important concept uh, in Torah, which, you know, you have to take that along with the 13 Ikarim, because Malachim are not one of the Ikarim necessarily, but, um, you know, uh, but, you know, Malachim, every, Hashem does things through Malachim, um, especially Nebuah, but, uh, you know, so that's a philosophical problem. I, I just am not knowledgeable enough about Malachim to get into that, so I just wanted to mention that in case there's an avenue for further thought. Okay, so, um, we're going to now read this forno, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to read through his commentary, and I'm going to summarize it as we go, and we'll note different points that answer these questions, and then we'll summarize, um, you know, uh, the answers at the end. Okay, so Sforno is going, as he often does, he uses Tanakh as a parish on Tanakh, which is something we should all do, right? What's the best parish on Tanakh is other areas in Tanakh. So there's this parak in Tehillim. There's actually a couple prakin, but uh, Tehillim Ayin Ches, which does a little summary of certain events in Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So... The Hebrew, I'm going to read the Hebrew here. Uh, it's Tehillim Ayin Ches Mem Testru Nunal. Yeshalach Bam Charon Apo Evra Vazaam Vitsara Mishlachas Malachi Ra'im. He, God, set upon them his fierce anger, fury, wrath, and trouble, and a band of harmful emissaries. Now, where do you recognize that passage from? The Haggadah, where in the Haggadah? Right. So this is the Drashos of Rabiosi Aglili on how many Makos struck the Mitzrayim, uh, and they darshan all of these things here. Um, so Malachi Ra'im, I'm translating as harmful emissaries, because it's a pet peeve of mine when they translate anything God does 
as evil, like evil emissaries. Okay, I don't, God doesn't do evil. So bad, okay, harmful. All right, then it says, um, he, I think I got the punctuation wrong there. He leveled a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death and he delivered their lives to pestilence. He smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, the first fruit of their strength in the tents of Ham. Okay, so Sworno is going to quote this. This is going to be a big uh, raya for his approach. So Sworno on Shemos Yudbez Yudbez says, I will pass through the land of Egypt to level a path for my anger. That was what we just quoted, which no agent can do. And I will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt, for I, Hashem, will discern between the difference between a drop of semen that is a firstborn and a drop which is not a firstborn. I am Hashem. All this is only fitting for Hashem alone. As the sages said, I am Hashem, I am He, and there is no other. Through this statement, He, God, provided the explanation for everything that was said before regarding why it was necessary for God Himself to do all these things, which He did not do with Sancheriv and others. Now, before we break down the Sporno, Anyone know what he's referring to with San Chiriv? I had a whole plan where like Fistel would be here and I would just tap him in that he would spit out the Tanakh narrative, but anyone know what happened with San Chiriv? The army vanished. Right. And who uh, who smote his army? Okay, so it says, yeah, it was a terrifying experience apparently. Uh, in Shayahu 3736, it says, uh, uh, um, an angel of Hashem went out and struck 185,000 people of the Assyrian camp. The rest rose early in the morning and behold, they were all dead corpses. Okay, and this is one of the fun things that you can like, uh, you know, as much as, um, as uh, biblical, biblical archaeologists, you know, like to challenge, you know, the historicity of certain narratives. I think if you go and you look at the uh, history of the Assyrian army under Sancherev, they, uh, it, it talks about this, like, yeah, suddenly, like, just the army just... You know, a huge part of it just died and like they stopped invading your slime. So that's a, a fun thing there. Okay, they don't say it was a Moloch in Wikipedia though. Um, so so let's break this down now. Okay. So first of all, a summary. The main point here is Sforno agrees that Hashem himself carried out Malchus Bakoros. And the reason why is he says Hashem. Only he can differentiate between Bechoros and non Bechoros. That's I discern the difference between the drop of semen that became a before and the one that didn't. Okay. So then he goes, he goes on. Okay. I'll, we'll, we'll summarize as we go. I'll put it together. Okay. Uh, and there will not be for you. So this is now on, um, there will not be for you a plague of destruction. The smiting will not reach you despite the destruction that I will enact in Egypt. When I strike, aside from the plague of the firstborn, he sent to the rest of the people, anger, fury, wrath, and trouble, a band of emissaries of harm. Okay. Just going back here, just going back to the puzzle can tell him. Okay, so you've got Yefales Nasiv Laapo. He uh, he uh, leveled a path for his anger. That's Machas Pokoros. Okay, which the next puzzle goes on to say. But then he also sent um, anger, fury, wrath, and and, uh, and trouble, a band of, uh, of of harmful emissaries. Okay, because this is going on in the swarm. Because were it not for the psicha, the skipping over, which he did out of compassion for Israel, they would not have escaped from the shar tsaros, the other travails that he sent to the rest of the Egyptian people in the manner of lest you be swept away in the sin of the city. He commanded them in the application of the blood as a sign so that they could escape, so that his name would not be desecrated, as it is stated in Yefesco 16.6, and I said to you, in your blood you shall live. Okay, so let's break this down. So point number two here is... Uh, aside from Machas Pachoros, there was this other plague, which he refers to as Shar Tsaros, which in the Pusik is anger, fury, wrath, and a band of emissaries of harm. Okay, so you've got two things going on on the night of Machas Pachoros. The plague of the firstborn, killing the, the firstborns, and then these other travails. Okay. Furthermore, he says, um, because we're not for the Psicha, uh, I'll summarize this as follows. So he, actually, I'll read it. Because were it not for the psicha, the skipping over, which he did out of compassion for Israel, they would not have escaped from the shard saros that he sent to the rest of the Egyptian people. Okay, and he commanded the application of the blood to save them from that. So what does this mean? So he's saying the purpose of the Dom Pesach was not about the Bechoros, okay? It was about saving the rest of the Jewish people from these other sorrows that were going on, okay? Um were it not for the psicha, the Jews would have been swept up in the sin of the city. Now, where's that from? 
Avram and yeah, and the the Sodom and Amor, the destruction of Sodom and Amor, right? Last Sunday here. Yeah, okay, right. So uh so lest he be swept up in the sin of the city. So this is a reference to the idea um that, and this is I think the he, he never states this explicitly, but I think this is the premise of the Sporno here, and he said this in um in uh in Sodom. So I think the earliest source is the Michalta of Rabbi Ishmael in Shemos Yudbez, which says uh, on our our subject, you may not leave the entrance of your house till morning. Magi, this tells you, uh, once permission is granted to the, to the destroyer to destroy, it doesn't differentiate between the righteous and the wicked. Um, and then he quotes a pasuk in Yeshayahu, which I, uh, when I was looking at this, Sworno learns this is about Yemosa Mashiach, but he says, ami bo uh, Go, my people, into your rooms and close your door behind you. Hide for a brief moment until the wrath has passed. Now, why would God have to tell his people? And these, I think these are tzaddikim and chachamim uh, uh, in, that, in that context. Why would he have to tell the chachamim and tzaddikim to go hide? Can't God protect them? The answer is no. When God unleashes the destroyer, it's going to be indiscriminate. Okay, so putting all of this together... Um, Putting all this together here, so this now explains why the two plagues are of a different nature. So Machas Bechoros was targeted, just Bechoros, but the Shard Saros was indiscriminate, and the Korban Pesach, the Dom of the Pesach, was to protect them from this indiscriminate plague. Yeah, tomorrow? We're going to get into that, yeah. That's one of the new things I found this morning. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, last point in this forno is it says he commanded them in the application of the blood as a sign so that they could escape so that his name will not be desecrated. So that's another interesting thing, which is that um, the problem with them not being saved is it would have been a desecration of the name of Hashem. Okay, he doesn't explain why, but like, what do you think would be the full Hashem if like all these Jews died? Yeah, maybe it would be yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> you know, meaning the Yitzhi's Mitzrayim wouldn't have happened as planned, or you would have just had a lot of Jews who died, and it would have looked, you know, Lama Yomer Mitzrayim, like more Bara Hotiam, but not even Hotiam, you know? So it, it would have looked bad if, uh, if, and all of the stuff that had been leading up to it about differentiating between the Jews and uh, and the Mitzrayim would not have happened. So it would have been a Chil Hashem either way. Okay. So then he goes on. Again, we're still just reading the Sforno and putting it together. Later on, the Sforno in Yud Beis uh, when it says, uh, as for you, you should not leave, because the house was marked with blood, and because of the warning, you should not leave. In this manner, uh, meaning on account of both conditions, of not leaving and marking the house, that's the conditions by which God skipped, in the manner of set a mark in Yechazkel 9.4. Okay, to strike um, the people of Egypt with anger, fury, and a band of emissaries of harm, so you might think that the term lin gof means to kill, okay? And you might think that it's referring to makas pachoros, which was a killing plague, okay? Here, though, he says, no, the term strike, negev, can be said of any plague, even if it's non-lethal, as in the statement, v'nagfu um, isha harav yatsu yeladaha v'lo yehi ason, they struck the uh, the pregnant woman and she gave birth prematurely, but there was no accidental fatality. So he's just bringing this in to show that don't think that negev proves that this is makas pokoros. Negev could also be referring to these other sorrows. And I will, and here's the key phrase, I will not allow the mashchis to enter the house, which is the mashchis, Hamashris es am Mitzrayim the ever of Azam Bahule, the destroyer of the people of Egypt with anger, fury, etc. So it's not that he's preventing the Makas Bahoros agents from entering in, because that's carried out by Hashem and that's not through a Mashkis. Mashkis is the uh this, these other plagues. Okay, so let's summarize and um and then we'll take stock. Okay, so we said that the common answer to question one, who carried out Mas Makas Bahoros, is that it's Hashem himself. That's the common answer. The problem is. Um, Shmos Yud Beis Chav Gimel says that there was another mashkis of all these other plagues, and it was not Hashem. So the solution is very simple. Hashem carried out Malchus Bukhoros by himself, but the other tsaros were carried out by Malach HaMashkis. Okay? Any questions on these facts so far? We're not done with the facts yet. Okay. The main thing is we understand how the Sforno is, is, is interpreting it. Okay. So now, tomorrow's question. What were these other tsaros? Okay. Um, anyone want to guess? Yeah. Maybe like secondary of, uh, okay. Okay. So I also guess that it was unique to Machas Bechoros that there were these other things that were brought about, and I I think and I you know if anyone knows about this then let me know. But um I I remember like twenty years ago Rebbe giving a shear on the Ramban on this, and the Ramban says something that indicates that like the Sidre Breshis like got all disrupted from Machas Bechoros. 
and that there were other effects like Remy didn't use this analogy, but like, uh, you know, I like to use this analogy of, um, even though I'm not a computer science guy, you can't just go in and change one thing and like not have other problems that are created, you know? So, so I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that God, you know, was, was a bad programmer, but I'm saying that like the way that God did Machas before us affected other things in a detrimental way. And like, it was an outgrowth of that. Okay. That's a possibility. And I, again, I'm half remembering this from a year from Rebbe, but I have no idea where it is. And, uh, but I think it's in the room in the room bond. Really? Yeah, I remember that as well. You do? Okay, good. It was like it was like normal things in the house would, would not operate properly. Yeah, exactly. And maybe I'm just thinking about uh because of my matrix analogy, I'm imagining like glitches in the matrix outside, but you know, yeah, they right. So there was additional punishments going on with the Elohim hey, Mitzrayim. Ooh. I just that might be a riot for Sworn later on. Okay, so we'll, we'll maybe come back to that. Okay, so I found an answer this morning. Um in uh Again, thanks to Tehillim with Rav Elia Danola's commentary. Okay, so the Talmud of the Sforno says on the on the phrase that we're talking about here, Yishalach Bam Haron Apo, Elu Hayu Madve Mitzrayim Haraim Bechol Maka Umaka. These were the horrible maladies of Egypt in each and every plague. Now, uh, anyone recognize that phrase Madve Mitzrayim Haraim? It's in the, uh, it is, it, I thought it was in the Toko also. It's in the, the earlier, it's in by Eschanan. Uh, it's in the like, Christopher. right. It's saying, I will, uh, you will not get, uh, I, I put the positive here. Uh, Hashem, imcha koholi, uh, Hashem will remove from you all sickness. And all of the bad maladies of Egypt that you knew. He will not put them upon you, but we'll put them on your foes. Now, I don't know if you ever read this and you're like, what is he talking about? Like uh, what maladies of Mitzrayim? So, um, there is uh, a, so this side point here, okay, in the Haggadah, um, it singles out two Makos, okay, well, three, Makos Bechoros, but it singles out Dom and Dever, okay, um, singles out Dom, right, I'm not imagining that, but Dever, Yad Chazaka Zoha Dever, as it says, Hina Yad Hashem Hoya um, strong hand refers to the Dever, as it is stated, Behold, the hand of Hashem shall strike your cattle, which are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks, a very severe pestilence. I don't know if you ever wonder about this. I always wonder why are we singling out Dever from among all the other Makos? Like it was a great plague, but like what, what's the significance of it? So um the Kolbo, among others, on the Haggadah says. The explanation of this is as follows. This refers not only to the livestock disease, but to the human epidemic as well. Uh, he says, There was not a single one of the makos that was not accompanied by an epidemic. Uh, as it is stated, behold, I will smite all your borders. That he learns is referring to this like, uh, this you know epidemic. Only this death, that's this epidemic. All of my plagues, that's this epidemic. Uh, and he says, this was expressed by the term hand, as it is written, behold, the, the hand of Hashem is upon. So in other words, the Pasuk in the Haggadah is confusing because you read the Haggadah and you're like, Yad Chazaka Dever. And then he quotes a Pasuk about the Dever of the livestock. But that's not what this Dever is referring to. This Dever is referring to the Dever. Uh, well, it's not exclusively referring to the Dever of the livestock. It's referring to the Dever of the, the sicknesses that the Egyptians got. And the Pasuk is being brought in as a riot that the word hand is associated with plagues. Okay, now where does the Kobo get this from? From Midrash Rabbah that says, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi Omer, Kol Maka Umaka Shaisa Ba'a Al Hamitrim Be Mitraim, Haya Hadevra Mimashmish Uba Ima. In every Maka that was visited upon the Egyptians, a contagion crept along with it. Um, as it says, Behold, I will smite. Um, and then it uses the, the same drasha with a hand. And if you're wondering why there was a epidemic with each Maka, you can read my article on <laughs> uh, uh, which is called the 11th plague, which I wrote about the purpose of having. Uh, sicknesses accompanying all the plagues. Okay, so um, so it seems that according to Sforno, according to Elia Danola, this was not unique to Marcus Pokoros. It was pestilences that were coming along with every plague, but somehow, I don't know if it was more intense or if it just reached a natural peak, but it was uh, it, it was a, a big enough threat by Marcus Pokoros that they needed to protect themselves from it, whereas apparently they didn't need that on the other, um, the other days. Okay, and, and beyond that, I don't know what he holds. Okay, so that's the answer is it was contagions of Egypt mentioned in Devarim, and they accompany each and every Maka. Okay, here we have a factual basis uh, for understanding the Sforno on Maka's Pekoros and Korban Pesach. So Maka's Pekoros was done by Hashem 
Um, and uh, the other Makos, uh, the other uh, shar Saros were done by the Mashkis. And the Korban Pesach was to protect the Jews from the shar Saros. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, really? Makos Bukhoros, uh, Korban Pesach has nothing to do with Makos Bukhoros. I seem to recall Korban Pesach having something to do with Makos Bukhoros. Okay, so where do you where do you get it from in your mind? Where, where, where does your mind go to that Korban Pesach was about Makos Bukhoros? And there's not one answer, but I'm just curious where you think of. The word Pesach, okay, so Pesach means to skip. And as we saw in the Pesukim, that seems to just be skipping over the houses of an Israel. Nothing about Bukhoros. So where where are uh, where's Korban Pesach linked to Bechora specifically? Uh, timing, that's true. If there's more, um... okay, I'll give you a hint. You put it on your forehead and your arm every day. <laughs> okay, so all right, so um, in in Yud Gimel it goes through the mitzvah Pidyon of uh, okay? So it says like this, it shall come to pass, this is in Yudimul, Yudal, Yudimul, it shall come to pass when Hashem will bring you to the land of the Canaanites as he swore to you and your forefathers, and he will have given it to you. You shall set apart every first issue of the womb to Hashem and of every first issue that is dropped by livestock that belong to you, the males are Hashem's. Every first issue donkey that you, you shall redeem with a lamb and a, or a kid. If you do not redeem it, you shall ax the back of its neck and you shall redeem every firstborn human among your sons. So you got the, the, uh, the pidyon of the Se, uh, sorry, the pidyon of the donkey and the giving of the, the firstborn uh, issue of livestock and then the pidyon of, uh, of humans. Okay. Then it says, and it should be when your son will ask you at some future time saying mazos. Okay. Now just side note here. Uh, I, 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 I don't know why I didn't incorporate it here. It's always fun to ask people, uh, you know, which, uh, where do you know the phrase, the question mazos from? So they'll say the Haggadah, the Arubanim. And you say, what is the, which of the sons, so which of the sons says mazos? The top, right? And if you say, what is he asking about? Most people assume that he's asking about the Pesach Matzah and Mara, but he's not, right? He's asking, and then Pesukim, he's asking about Bechoros, okay? And it should be when your son will ask you at some future time, saying, what is this? Meaning, it could be a January, uh, a frosty January 7th morning where uh, you're, 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 you're axing your donkey's neck and your Ben Tom says, what is this? Okay, and this is the answer you give him, okay? Or it could be that... Um, you know, that you're, uh, well, I guess it can't be you're redeeming your firstborn and your son asks you because he's not old enough, but you're, you're, you're redeeming a firstborn and your your your, uh, your nephew asks you, you know, what are you doing? And he says, uh, you shall say to him, with a strong hand, Hashem removed us from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it happened when Paro stubbornly refused to send us out that Hashem killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I offer to Hashem all male first issue of the womb, and I shall redeem all the firstborns of my sons. And it shall be a oh, sorry sign, not sig, a sign upon your arm and an ornament between your eyes, for with a strong hand Hashem removed us from Egypt. Okay, so you do see that there was something about the night of Makas Bechoros and um, and Hashem redeeming the firstborns, and the firstborns seem to have somehow you know been saved. Okay, but it's not fully clear yet. Okay. So Sporno here says something that is going to create problems. He says like this, every firstborn in the land of Egypt, he says, The firstborns of Israel deserve to be stricken along with them in the manner of lest you be swept away in the, by, in the sin of the city. But he saved them by sanctifying them to himself, making the human firstborn in Israel like the Nazirim or greater, designated for the service of God and prohibited to do mundane labor. Okay, so we have an additional point here. The Bechori Yisrael deserved to be stricken along with the Bechori Mitzrayim on account of Pentecost, but they were saved when Hashem sanctified them for himself. They were not saved because of the Pesach. They were saved by Kedushas Bechoros, okay? So that's an explanation of this passage in Yud Gimel, which is that, that um, and again, it fits into the Pesukim, because he's getting it from the Pesukim, is uh, the kid's asking, why do you do Petion Bechoros? And you're answering... Because God saved, um, uh, because God killed all the firstborns in the land of Egypt, then I I sanctify all of my firstborns to Hashem. Okay, so not having to do the Korban Pesach. Okay, but there is a problem here, according to the way Sforno has been learning it. Okay, what is the problem with saying that the Bechori Yisrael deserve to be stricken with the Bechori Mitzrayim on account of Pentecostal Babylon Ha'ir? It's Hashem Himself doing it. Okay, and therefore. Why should it have affected the Jewish firstborns in the first place? Okay, so let me spell this out. Okay, he says 
Okay, so hold on a second here. So we have, okay, yeah. So problem number one is like this. If Makas Pohoros was carried out by Hashem, okay, targeted strike, how could the principle of Penti Sate Avon Ha'ir apply to Israel's firstborns? Okay, it was a targeted strike. The Bukhari Israel were, should never have been in danger in the first place. Okay, so that's problem number one. Okay, is that clear? Okay, problem number two comes from the way that Sforno learns the purpose of the Makos. Now, if I asked you what is the purpose of the Makos, what answers would you give? <laughs> uh, you know, not a trick question. Teach your ideas about Hashem, okay? And anything else? To pressure Paro to let the people go, okay? And I think there's maybe one more candidate. Okay, so I'll include that under, uh, you know, teaching, there's three audiences, right? There's teaching B'nai Israel, teaching Paro, and teaching um, the Egyptians. Say again? And the world, right? And to punishment's right, right? So there's there's some element of punishment, some element of demonstration of ideas, and some element of the practical, like, letting them out, okay? Sporno, though, has a unique take here. I don't know if it's unique, but it's, uh, it's a more specific take. So going to our Parsha last week, it was last week, yeah. But Marta El Paro, so this is at the Sne, Hashem tells Moshe, you will say to Paro, Komar Hashem, Bani Bechor Yisrael. Israel is my firstborn son. But Omar Elecha, so I say to you, Shalach es bani v'yavdini, uh, send out my son that I that he may serve me. But mine le shalcho, and but if you but you have refused to send him out, hine anochi horik es bini chabacharacha. I will kill your firstborn son. Okay. So what kind? What do we call this style of punishment? Mina kenegan mina. Okay. So Sforno says like this on that pasuk four twenty three. Behold, I shall kill your firstborn son in accordance with divine justice, which is measure for measure. As it is said, and cause every man to find according to his way. By the way, I didn't bring these in here, but anywhere in Tanakh where, where um, Sforno talks about Makas Bechoros, he mentions his Mida Kenegad Mida uh, in Tehillim, in Yeshayahu, in, uh, in Eov. So again, consistent throughout his writings. He says now, Ki amna makas bohoros levada haisa la mishpat onish leparo mikol makos. Indeed, only the plague of the firstborns out of all the plagues was sentenced, sorry, typo here, was sentenced as a punishment for paro. The rest of the plagues were sent as a sign and a wonder in order that the Egyptians do tshuva. Uh, this is a uh, favorite puzzle of the Spornos in Yefesco 18.32. God does not desire the death of the of the one who deserves death. Uh, he never closes the gates uh, of, of repentance before them at all. So, Machas Bukhoros is Midak Negan Mida, and he also says uh, that Pius Yamsuf was Mida Kenegan Mida, but that's not one of the Makos. So um, that's why this is said in, in the language of Mida Kenegan Mida. Makos Bukhoros is Mida Kenegan Mida. And then he goes on, he says, if they had been wise enough to return to God out of love of his goodness and awe of his greatness, which is the tshuva that reaches the, the throne of glory, which saves and grants favor in the eyes of God, as the sage of, of blessed memory said, iniquities are reckoned as merits, or at least to do tshuva like servants out of fear of his ability to punish. But the plague of the firstborn and the drowning of Paro and his army in the sea were divine judgments measure for measure. Okay. Um, so in other words, God's hope, so to speak, that's why it's the if, was that they would do tshuva. Um, and, uh, but, but this is ultimately going to be the punishment uh, um, for, for refusing to send out the Jewish people. Okay. Now, so we, if you say that Machas Bechoros was connected Mida to Paro for refusing to send out the Jewish people, okay, what other problem do we have with the Sforno's narrative that um, that God saved the Bechor Yisrael through sanctifying them. What was their sin? Okay, so the way I phrased it is, if Machus Bechoros was Mida Kenegan Mida punishment for the Egyptians for refusing to send out the Jews, why were the Bechor Yisrael liable at all? They didn't refuse to send out the Jews. So I understand killing the firstborn Egyptians, okay, because that's somehow a Mida Kenegan Mida for Parl. But the firstborn Jews were, were not there at all. Okay, we're, we're not liable at all for, for they didn't have any influence on sending out the uh, the Jewish people. Okay, so to make this clear, okay, before we answered, I made a chart because I like charts. Okay, so for people only listening to audio, I apologize. Uh, and I put this in Hebrew because it fit. Okay, so on the top of the chart, we have the Anashim, the, the people. Then we have the Maka. Then we have Aidemi, who the agent was. Then we have the Hishaibus, the liability. And then we have the Hatsala, how they were saved. Yeah. Well, so the last question is asking that wasn't the Korean Israel or 
Correct. So you could say, though, that like because Paro is, you know, the leader of all of Egypt, then like, you know, and he himself is a before, then somehow God is communicating this idea. Uh, it, it's a valid question. And like, I think this is part of the question also, why the firstborn animals have to die? You know, maybe it's part of the Egyptian theology. You know, I, I, that's that is an avenue for further study about why that's the best media connected media thing. Uh, but I, I didn't uh, explore that here. OK, so we have. So let's go through you here. There are four groups of people in uh, on, on the night of the 15th. There was the Bukhari Mitz Mitzrayim, the firstborn Egyptians, then the Shar Am Mitzrayim, the rest of the Egyptians, then the Bukhari Israel, and then the rest of the Am Yisrael. Okay, what Maka did the Bukhari Mitzrayim get? It was Makas Bukhoros. Okay, who was it carried out by? HaKadosh Baruch What was their liability? It was Vatma'in L'Shalcho. Haro, you know, refused to send them out, and that's Mita Kenegin Mita somehow what David said. Okay, and how did they get saved? They didn't. Okay, all right. Then we got the Shar Am Mitzrayim. What was their Maka? The other Tsaros, right? So Ebrazam, the diseases, okay. Um, who was that carried out by? The Mashkis, okay, the Malacha Mashkis, um, or the band of Malachim. Uh, why were they liable? Nope. What, 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 sorry, why were they subject to the, this? Oh. They're part of the nation, right? So Pensi Sevei Babon Ir seems to be that this is just going out. Or you can say it's the liability. You could, you could say it's whatever reason God wanted this other Maka to go for all these other plagues. And then how were they saved? They weren't. Okay. Now, before Yisrael, oh, sorry, we're skipping before Yisrael for a second. The rest of the Jewish people. They had this, the Shard Saros, okay? Who was that carried out by the Malcham Ashkis? What was their liability that that's Pensi Sevei Babon Ir? They were going to get caught up in everything. And how did they get saved? The rest of the Jews? The Dom, the Korban Pesach, and don't, not leaving their houses. Okay, but then here's the problematic level. The Bechor Yisrael seemed to have been in danger, right, of being killed. Okay, Machas Bechoros, seemingly. Uh, and the agent of Machas Bechoros is Kadosh Baruch Hu. Their liability, though, okay, he said, Smoro says, it's Pensi Sevei Babon Ir, and how were they saved? Say again? Uh, no, in other words, what did they have to do to be saved? Or what happened to them? Sanctified, right? Is Kiddush Bukhoros, right? That's what we say in, in Perak Yud Gimot Shemos. So again, to reiterate the problems here, is the problems are in this third line. I'll just say it one more time. If Machas Bukhoros was carried out by Hashem, how could the principle of Penti Safed Ba'avon Ha'ir even apply? It was a targeted strike by Hashem himself. The Bukhor Yisrael were never in danger. And if Machas Bukhoros was Midak Negan Mida, punishment for the Egyptians refusing to send out the Jews, why were the Bukhor Yisrael liable at all? They didn't refuse to send out the Jews. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that did not have to happen. Uh, that would be, uh, the would be uh, but I guess like, what would have been the, uh, if, it, if it was a sign for the Tara, like what would have been the what? The sign to Paro? Yeah. Well, it was for Paro. Right. Like the first one who would have been killed. Right. So that that's for and, yeah. 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 But if also we're saying now that that it was also for the Israel, wouldn't that have diluted the message to Paro? Because he could have just said, look. It right. It would have diluted. Maybe that's part of the Chil Hashem. Also remember that the Makas Bukhoros was for punishment, not for signs and uh, uh, demonstrating, you know, ideas. Oh, what the, what the, uh, I mean, I mean, obviously, Mina Kanegan is also demonstrating ideas, but that's the only one framed as an Onish. Yeah. Okay. So where would you look for an answer to this? Because <laughs> this is one year. One year, again, I did this and I got stuck here. <laughs> yeah, no, there's one sugya here that we haven't really explored yet. Is the Bukhoros. Okay, so in Bamidbar, okay, um, there's another reference to the Bukhoros. So it says in Bamidbar Gimel uh, uh, 11 through uh, 13, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Behold, I have taken the Levim from among the children of Israel in place of every firstborn, the first issue of every, uh, oops, sorry, there's a typo there, the first issue of every womb among the children of Israel and the Levim shall be mine. Uh, for every firstborn is mine. On the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified every firstborn in Egypt for myself, from man to beast, they shall be mine, I am Hashem. Now, sidebar here, uh, the, the factual premise is that which the swarm is going to rely on, but I, I, haven't, I can't go into because I didn't really go through this sugya. Originally, the avoda was going to be done through the Bechoros. And at some point, then the then Hashem chose the Levim instead. How that worked, why that was, why the Levim 
uh, why the firstborns lost the right and the Levim earned the right, and how that doesn't involve a change of Hashem's will. That's also Gia, yeah, and Swarno has a lot of stuff on that, but that's just not part of this year. Okay, but that's the premise of this. So that's what this is describing. So again, it, 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 it's pointing out that God acquired the firstborns on Marcus, the night of Marcos Pohoros. So what does Sforno say here? He says, um, I'll, I'll highlight this in a second. For every firstborn is mine. Originally, the divine service was done with the firstborns. Okay. On the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified every firstborn in Israel for myself. However, during the plague of the firstborn, in which the Israelite firstborns were more deserving of punishment on account of the generation's iniquity, since they were the most respected, and since they didn't deserve to be saved from the plague of the region, in the manner of penti safed ba'avon ha'ir, lest you be swept away in the sin of the city, I, Hashem, saved them by sanctifying them to myself in prohibiting them to be involved in mundane labor, just as any sanctified animal is prohibited to be sheared or used for labor. Okay, so key phrase here is just to note, okay, the firstborns were more deserving of punishment on account of the generation's iniquity, okay, uh, since they were the most respected. And since they didn't deserve to be saved from the plague of the region in the manner of Pentecostal above on ear. Okay, clue, clue. Okay, onward. Rib Elia Dinola um, uh, uh, addresses a question of what does it mean that the firstborns were the most respected? Now, I don't think you need commentaries for this, but again, it's always nice if you have something from the Sforno. So Elia Dinola in Tehillim Kuf He Lamed Vav, of all places, which says, Onam. He smote every firstborn in their land, the first of all their strength. Um, uh, Elia Danola says, uh, misa. For the head of the household was considered a firstborn with regards to the death and the plague of the firstborn. The in bias asher in shamais, as it says, there was no household in which there was no corpse. So he's saying here, firstborn does not just mean firstborn, right? Firstborn means a head of the house or a leader in the house. Now I read this and I was like, that's sketchy. That's a, that's a pulling a fast one. Okay. So if you don't like Sforno saying this, Rashi also says this, okay. On Ki'in Shambay, Sister In Shambay, Yish Bechor, Mace. If there was a firstborn in the house, he died. In Shambay, if there was no Bechor, Gadol Be'ebayis Kauri Bechor. Then the head of the house is called a Bechor. Shnemar says this, Af Ani Bechor Et Nehu. I will appoint you as a firstborn of the house. Okay, so you see, firstborn does not just mean literal firstborn, it means head of the house. And if Rashi is not good enough for you, not that anyone would not accept a shot from Rashi, uh, the Mithilta, the Rashi B, okay, Rav Shimon Bar Yachai says, Rav Yaakov Omer Vachi Lo Haya Bais Shalo Haya Bo Bechor. Really? Every single house had a before? Like, what about if a couple just got married, right? And then they didn't have uh, kids yet, you know? Or what if it was all daughters, right? So he, so the, the Mechilta says, hagan rishonim. This is how things were done in the early days. Mishalo haya lo bin before, someone who didn't have a firstborn son, haya kore hagado shabbanav before. He would call the 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 greatest of his uh, of his children before. Indian Shinemar, and he quotes a different passage than Rashi quotes from Divra Hayamim. Uh, it says, Shimri uh, Chosa Son of the son of the sons of Mirari, who also had sons, Shimri the chief, although he wasn't not a firstborn, his father appointed him as the chief. So Bukhor does not just mean um firstborn, it means leader. And it's hard for us in our society, in America at least, uh, and I think I don't know, I think most Western countries, to really imagine a uh firstborn dominated society where firstborn is like we're totally in charge, totally the legacy, totally like had all these rights. The closest thing I know of, and I don't really know much about this, but I know that my great grandfather uh, on my Chinese side of the family, the firstborns, so we have a thing where like firstborn gets a double portion. In apparently in China, or at least the part of China we were from, firstborns got everything. And every all the other kids got nothing, you know? And like it was a real, you know, I, there's must be some fancy term for it of like not patriarchal, but like firstborn patriarchal, you know? Um, and so they were the leaders, okay? So, um, so what difference does it make? So he goes on and it says later on in Bamibur, this is when the swap actually happens in Bamibur Ches. Therefore, the Levites shall come to serve the tent of meeting. Uh, you shall purify them. You shall wave them as wave uh, service for presented. Presented are they to me among all the children of Israel in place of the first issue of every womb, the firstborn of every one of the children of Israel, I've taken to myself. For every firstborn of the children of Israel became mine of man and livestock. On the day I struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. I took the Levites in place of every firstborn among the children of Israel. Uh, okay, then I assigned... Um, okay, I don't need to read this part. I don't know why I added that. Okay, so Sforno explains. For the firstborn of the children of Israel became mine, because the avoda used to be done by the firstborns, since they were the most respected members of the household, and they had the right to the avoda. 
On the day I smote all the firstborns, I sanctified them. Sforno says, however, the reason I made redemption necessary for them. Now, this is talking about redemption of the human firstborn, Pidyon Haben. The reason I made that a mitzvah is because on the day that I smote, not smoke, I smote the firstborn uh, Egyptians, I sanctified them for myself in that they should not occupy themselves with any ordinary labor at all, just as I prohibited them from, uh, prohibited from shearing or working with a firstborn animal. And this I did in order to save them through the law relating to uh, Hekdesh, to, to a sacred object. For they were not worthy to be saved from the plague of the harmful emissaries, since they were the most honored among the people, and they were the onus, or the Hebrew words, the kolar, the collar, the prisoner's band of everyone, uh, sorry, and the onus of everyone was resting upon them. Therefore, I said that they are to be redeemed so that they will thereby become non-holy and hence permitted to do ordinary labor. Now, again, trying to skirt the issue of the new setup of the Pidion Bechoros, we're seeing something very interesting here about why were the Jewish firstborns liable uh, in the uh, on the night of the fifteenth of Nisan? What is it? What what does it sound like? Sforno's emphasizing in all these cases here. Okay, their status and and what uh, so what lack of leadership. Okay, so the yeah. Did it all help to keep see, keep the Europe like some sort of like bad thing that the Jews did maybe. Right. So I actually did not include this. I don't know why I didn't include this, but um, Sforno is very big on the, I mean, everyone's big on this, but the the sinfulness of the Jews. Like if you look at the Sforno in the beginning of uh, Sefer Shemos, he talks about how basically um, he has very good, I mean, very good commentary on the, uh, on the beginning of uh, Shemos where he says, why does it only name the, uh, the you know, the Shvatim? Because the Torah typically names people who were tzaddikim. And then after that, things went downhill. And he says, um, uh, you know, then the generation died. Oh, so he says, the Ela kol chayem hayilam oros. All the people who were named in the beginning of Shemos were like luminaries. Velo yata ador the tarbus ra, and the generation didn't go bad. Anam achrei mosam, but after they died, lo hayu ha tzadikim shebe meneihem kol kach hashuvim be'ine elokim ba'adam. The people, their 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 uh, descendants were not so chashuv in the eyes of God and man. Then the whole hadora who the whole generation died. Kol shivim nefesh. Shlo bahador lekilko gamur koy The 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 generation did not come to complete degradation during their lives. Okay, then they all went bad. And he says stuff, for example, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Haru v'yishritsu, they were fruitful. And usually we say yishritsu is like they swarmed, they teamed, it's referring to number. He says, achar shemesu kol shivim nefesh, natu ladarche shratzim. They went to the the, the sheretz-like ways. Shratzim uh, leber shakas, and he says a little pun. They ran to the well of destruction. So he holds that the, that basically the leadership from Yaakov's generation uh, and Yosef's generation was very good. And then once they died, the leaders, because there were no leaders, then the whole generation went downhill. And who had the mantle of leadership? It was the Bechoros. Okay. And not only that, not only this is going to answer your question before about why um, the punishment for Paro not sending out the people. Um, why did the Egyptian firstborns deserve to die? So the Sforno, says, so there's two psukim that describe which firstborns died in Egypt. There's 11.5 in Shemos, which says... Every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Paro who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the maidservant who is behind the mill, and every firstborn of the animal shall die. Second Pasuk in Shemos 12, 29, at midnight Hashem struck all the firstborns of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Paro who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the animals. Now, you probably, when you're doing Schneidmecker, you probably like read this and you're like, yeah, it's basically saying the same thing in different words. <laughs> you know, what's the, like, what do you, what do you think of when you think of why is it highlighting from the firstborn of Paro who sits on the throne to like, this other guy, like, what's the point it's making? All yeah, all of them. Okay, but why emphasize like the first one on the throne to like the maid servant uh, or the the captive? Status. status thing, right? So I I also think status, highest status to the lowest status. Okay, Sforno says no. There's a difference. He says on Shemos eleven five, from the firstborn of Paro to the firstborn of the maid servant. This means from the most respected of them to the lowest class. Okay, so the first instance is status, first respected, the lowest. But from the firstborn of Paro to the firstborn of the captive means who hayos min hayoser chote bezeh ad hachote pakos mikulan. That it's the one who sinned the most to the one who sinned the least. Okay, so in other words, he seems to be saying that that. The Egyptian firstborns were also liable for leadership reasons, okay, or for some complicity in this uh, in this maka. And in fact, 
Um, there is a perush on Lamaki Mitzrayim Bivachorehem. So plain shot Lamaki Mitzrayim Bivachorehem is I struck the Egyptian firstborns. But what's the, anyone know the Midrash on Lamaki Mitzrayim Bivachorehem? Yeah, is that the firstborns in Egypt instigated a war against Paro because they were sick and tired of uh, of of all the bad stuff happening to Klai Israel, and they went to war. And uh, and I, I think um, I, I read this in Rabbi Zucker here, uh, and I can't remember if he said this or if he was quoting someone who said this. But the firstborns were in charge of the army, like they were like the uh, you know, um, and like part. So it was like almost like a coup, basically, like that they had a, led a coup, and then Paro like slaughtered them. So a bunch of Bechoros got killed even before. Marcus Pokoros happened. So you see, though, that like they had sway in the nation. And according to some shita, uh, I think it's mentioned in Tosvos, this is why we do Shabbos Adadal. There's the the common reason of the Jews tied up the animal and the Mitzrayim weren't able to like say anything, uh, you know, even though this was the Egyptian God. And then the other one is that that uh, this is when the, there was the Bechor rebellion. Point being, though, that the Bechoros of Mitzrayim and the Bechoros of Israel, Bechoros in that society in general, had tremendous sway over the nation. So the Egyptian Bechoros were somewhat liable for going along with Paro's plan and for retaining the Jews. And the Jewish Bechoros were liable for not getting everyone to do tshuva. Okay, we're not getting everyone to like get their act together and get rid of the Avodah Zara. Okay, so now we can answer our question. So to reiterate, the problem was if Machas Bechoros was carried out by Hashem, how could the principle of Penti Safed Ba'avon Ha'ir apply? It was a targeted strike by Hashem himself. The Bechor Yisrael were never in danger in the first place. Problem two is if Machas Bechoros was Mida Kneg and Mida punishment of the Egyptians for refusing to send out the Jews, why were the Bechor Yisrael liable at all? They didn't refuse to send out the Jews. So we realized we made a mistake. And once we correct this mistake, we can understand the answer. What mistake did we make on our chart? The Hishaibus. The okay, what, what, what would you say? Well, you just, you just um, mentioned that they were leaders of Protestant. Right. Mm -hmm. That is true, but Sforno does explicitly say that the reason the Bukhoros would have been killed is Penti Safeb Avon Ha'ir. So we do still have to factor that into account. Oh, sorry. But they were the ones that, that were responsible for the Avon Ha'ir. Uh, correct. They were responsible for the Avon Ha'ir. But I think there's a more primary problem. Yeah? These two questions here. Um, these two questions. And then the question is, I think we made a mistake in how we filled out the chart. Yeah, Tamar? Yes. Okay. So Sforno, so we made a mistake here. Okay. Sforno used the term Makas Medina, and and um, let me just go back to show you so you know I'm not lying. Um, uh, he said, uh, um, oh yeah, here we go. Ubios and Bilti Ruim Lihinas, I mean Makas Medina, the Maka of the of the uh, of the of the 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 city, the 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 country, whatever you know. So the com combination of the use of that term with Talking about Pantasy Fed Bavon Ha'ir with our questions means that they were subject to the Shartzaros, okay? And it was carried out by the Malahamashis, so it was indiscriminate, okay? And they were subject to the Avon Ha'ir. But Sforno did say they were more liable, okay? And why were they more liable? Because of their leadership role. And what was the remedy? It was Kirush Bechoros. So how do we solve this? Okay. So the answer is like this, okay? And I'll put this on the screen in a second. I just want to talk it out is that all of Chai Israel were deserving of destruction because they were all sinful and God unleashed a, a destroyer. And if they didn't align themselves with, with the ideas of Avodah Zashem and Korban Pesach and rejecting Avodah Zara, they would have been swept away. Okay. But the Bechoros, because they were leaders, they were more liable and therefore they needed extra protection. And what was their extra protection is they had to devote themselves to God by being sanctified as firstborns uh, and taking on a completely different role from the rest of Israel to make up for their um, for their their lack of leadership, okay? So just to read my formulation of the Sforno's answers to both problems, the Bechor Yisrael were not subject to Makas Bechoros, but to the Makas Medina, namely the Shart Saros that affected the rest of the people. Since this was carried out by the Malach HaMashchis, then the phenomenon of Penti Safed Ba'avon Ha'ir rendered them vulnerable. And since they were more liable than the rest of Am Yisrael, they needed additional protection via Kiddush Bechoros. 
Okay. And I'll give an analogy. Now, remember, I gave this year in 2022, and we were still kind of like in pandemic mode then. <laughs> um, and uh, and so the analogy I gave is that let's say you have someone who is um, uh, immunocompromised, okay, uh, versus a normal person. And they're going out and there's a contagion, there's a pandemic going on. So it's the same indiscriminate threat, but the person who has, um, who's immunocompromised needs greater immunity. You might need additional boosters or whatever, you know, but it's from the same thing that, that everyone else is liable to. So, so to here, all of Pfizer was liable because they, uh, they had whatever, bad actions, bad of Zara, whatever it was. That's why they were all subject to this indiscriminate destruction. It was not media connected media punishment that Paro was subject to, uh, of Marcos Pacoros, because then it would be targeted and they wouldn't need protection. Rather, it was the general sinfulness that Kali Israel had, which everyone needed to be involved in the, in the Dom Pesach to get rid of. But the Bahoros, because of their failure in leadership, needed to rededicate themselves uh, to, to take on a leadership role in the nation, which would have been permanent were it not for the fact that Swarno holds that the Cheda Eagle made, you know, caused uh, them to lose that role and then they got switched for the Levine, you know. But that's that is how we uh, we resolve all of these uh, these these things. Okay. Uh, so again, it turns out counterintuitive. I think the statement I made still holds true that Corbin Pesa, according to Sforno, has nothing to do with Makas Bohoros because Corbin Pesa was protecting all of Am Yisrael from the Shar Tsaros, okay, uh, which were unleashed on the nation. Um, and the firstborn's sanctification is what protected them from not a targeted strike, but from the general destruction. And uh, the rest of Mitzrayim, was, the firstborns were targeted for Midah Kenegad Mida that Paro didn't send out God's firstborn, so God's going to destroy his firstborn, which is all the Bechoros. And then the rest of Amit's rhyme is subject to the the, the nation, uh, the, the national destruction. Yeah. Are you saying that there are really two types of models happening? Yes, the exactly. The general, There's the general destruction, contagion, and surgical, and surgical strike on, on the first ones. Yes. Uh, this is me telling you that the Bacorians are really subject to the other Yeah, I'm getting it from two things in the Sforno. One is he... Um, his use of the phrase, um, uh, uh, I'll just read it in Hebrew again. Shahayu ha this is our Bechoros, our firstborns, Ru'uyim le'anish ba'avon hador. They were liable for punishment from the iniquity of the generation, which again is not the Mida Kenegad Mida of, of B'ni Bechor Yisrael, of Machas Bechoros. It's the Avon Hador of the Jew Jewish generation, because they were the most exalted, or sorry, most respected. Okay, and that's, I'm trying to show that that was the position of the Pokoros in general, is that they were leaders. And they were not worthy to be saved from the uh, the the plague of the, of the country in the manner of lest they be swept up in the plague of the city, which is also not Lashon of Targeted to strike Makas Bukhoros. So Makas Medina is is the is the Maga that affected the Medina, which is the Shard Um also there's one sworn I didn't incorporate, which is in um uh in the description of the job of the Levim. If I can't find it uh really quickly, then I'll just paraphrase it. Um in I think this is in uh Baha'aloska, uh he says. Um, no, there's a place where he describes what the firstborns have to do in order to get kapara uh, for their failure of leadership. And he says they have to be malamed das to the Am in terms of like Yidiyas Hashem or something like that, you know, meaning that they allow their generation to, to go in the ways of the Egyptians and they're sanctified in order to have this role of what we now know as the Levium role, which is to teach the nation and to lead them in the proper way. Yeah, Tamar? Yeah. Um, I say that Hashem sanctified the firstborn Levine at the time when he struck the firstborn in his right. Right. And so was saying that just like chronological, like at the same time. No, it, it was it was to save them from the other 
play that was going out of time. Right. The, the one that is, the, the plague of the Shard Saros is not is well, it's mentioned in the Puskin, the Lo Yitin Hamashlis, Lavo El Bajetam Lingov. I will not let the Mashlis go into your houses to destroy. So it is mentioned. Yeah. Um, I also just answer Yago's question. Where do we get this from? He also says here, Shalohayu Ruim Linasa Nigae Mishlachas Malachim, right? That the firstborns were subject to the band of evil Malachim, which is the, the Machas Medina. Okay. Now, yes, Dave. What does so what it was was they had to it was usher for them to do other jobs he says that they were sanctified in the in um shalis asku bavodas hediot klal they were not allowed to do any other work just like with the firstborn behema you can't shear it and you can't use it for mundane work so the firstborn humans Afterward. afterwards yeah subsequently at the, at the time, it's good. I mean, did they have to do any actions to get this? Close? Seems like not. Seems like it was like, okay, you owe me, God says, you know, that you're going to now pledge yourself to my service in the manner of like being the Levim. And it, it sounds like that would not have really manifested itself, presumably until the Mishkan. If they could live up to that, they could have saved because God wanted to save them. Well, it's funny because it's not funny, it's sad, but they didn't live up to it and then they got taken away from them, you know, because it was all, it was also. Yeah. They didn't get killed though, right? They, they was, yeah, just just being like designated as such uh, apparently was enough as uh, right? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a good question about how, you know, at least with the, the Korban Pesach, the Jewish people had to do the action of slaughtering and putting the Dom on. You know, here it seems like they didn't have to do an action. Yeah, Ariel? Yeah, I, I know this is a topic, but like, you know, it seems like there's like a thing with the first ones, like, like that. Like, is it like, a, like this is for to talk about like exactly what, you mean what problem they had about yeah. why they failed in leadership? Yeah, it's just that, you know, like, we know what they didn't Right. Yeah. Right. I have not seen it. Uh, I did do a search on Alator for every word before in all the Sporno writings and Ilya Danilo. I didn't see him allude to anything more than that. Yeah. Yes. Are we serious? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll take yeah, David Fishman first. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if you made the point before, but there's just the phrase B'nei B'chor Yisrael fits very well with, with this idea of B'chor. B'nei Yisrael are not firstborn of anything. They, right. they are That's good they're gods. Their gods are creation that carries God's value, so to speak. Right. 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 They're the leaders. They were designated as the firstborn. That's a good point. Yeah. And 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 they have this mission. Right. Right. The, this is a little microcosm within the the nation that the, the each each individual firstborn does this to reflect the the role of the firstborn as a whole. Yeah. So the Mashis was being brought uh, to punish all the Egyptians. Yeah. Um, and now the only reason that was that for me was because he was in her show for Mashis and not for inside the Russia. Yeah. So then when Israel puts the down on their door and then stops, that's like, so without Hashkaf protecting the Israel, just naturally going to their house. Right. They put the down on the door and now Hashkaf is going to protect the house. Right. But he's now people before in the house also. Yeah. So everybody's being called Pesach. Now, what would happen if you didn't have a Kiddush before? So if you didn't have a Kiddush before, then apparently the the whatever the contagion was would affect the Bukhoros in the house. And it wouldn't affect the other the other people. And now I don't know I don't know how that happens because you're you're saying that the the implication of the Pesukim is that the mosh case is like barred at the door from coming in. Right. Yeah. Function shouldn't it naturally help the Russia doesn't help society? The, the uh, yeah. So the, the way I'm learning it is that the Bukhor, so in other words, the Bukhoros were also receiving, so to speak, the immunity boost from the Korban Pesach, but they needed more because they were more sus subject to it. And that's what the Kedusha, the Kedusha did. The me the mechanics of how it worked, I'm not sure about. And I'm not like that. It was really the all the Israel were really the the Egyptians were the Rishayim, and just came into the Rishayim, and just came into the Rishayim, and now the Rishayim. No, the Jews, the, the, the B'nai Israel were also like Rishayim. But the Mashtis was, was designed for the Rishayim, too? The, the, the Mashtis would have destroyed everyone in Mitzrayim. It was, it was, it was um, unleashed because of the Egyptians, presumably. They were like Rishayim's. The objectives of the Mashkis. Right. I mean, so we could step up in that because even though they're in Sadiq, meaning these are the Mashkis, they're not really part of the Mashkis, but right. everybody gets swept up in that, right? Right. So all of them saw the Korahs and the Red Right. 
Now, once you know the Dan Pesach, which stops that process of burning the Roshan, the Sadiqiyah, yeah. now why do you say, okay, then now the, the Bukhors don't deserve that protection of, of, of Karl Pesach? You know, right. So, so I'm going to try to make a move here. I have not thought this through. So I'm, maybe you can answer this with the whole point of my last shear on the Sforno on Sodom and Amora, which is that the way that the Zuchus works and the way the Hashgacha works is not about like a, a magical shield, right? It is the, the reason why why uh, Avram was arguing for 50 and 40 and stuff was what is the, a critical mass of a distinct social group that can facilitate tshuva of everyone else? Okay, and that's the basis of this. So maybe you can say that there's some idea here that Am Yisrael is a social group and the the main thing without Korban Pesach, they would be indistinguishable from the Mitzrayim. So they need to differentiate themselves by rejecting a Vodazara. But the Bechoros, in addition to being part of that and needing that same differentiation, they had their own social influence on the nation and amongst themselves. And it would have been a different liability for like leading the nation astray and a different like responsibility for like leading them in the right direction. And they needed their own um, their own uh, 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 remedy for for differentiating themselves and, and being under a different hashkacha. In this case, it was saying, I misused my role of leadership and now I'm going to devote myself in exclusively to teaching Yediyah Sashem. Right. Yeah. And they also, they also, maybe the Bukhoros didn't have this Kiddush Bukhoros, so maybe then the Mashas would have gone to the Right, that's, that's, that's another possibility, right. That is that is possible, yeah. Yeah, Chaim? I think more of a question, maybe it's the other mechanic, Yeah. Does that mean to say that if there wasn't the condition of Horus, right? Then the core of the horse were got killed in the house. And then and this might have been the same problem, but then it doesn't sound like the Moshkis would go into the house and then discriminately kill the Bukhor. So the, the way I'm I'm thinking the way I was thinking about it earlier is it's not that it would discriminately kill the Bukhor. That's why I keep using this analogy of immunocompromised, that if you unleash a certain amount of of, of COVID and you have a room full of 50 people and five of those people are immunocompromised, then they're going to get subject to it, not because they were targeted, but because they were more susceptible. You know? Okay. Yeah, Ari? What was the effects of the regular masters on the Mitzvah? So he, he, the, the only thing we got was that reference to the puzzle in Mitzrayim of Chol Madve Mitzrayim Haraim and the Kol Choli. So it sounds like it was an actual disease. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I I don't really know. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure how how it would have uh, gone down or what the uh, you know what why that was chosen. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, I just want to go back. How does four on the ten just my dad and that looks like this time? Um. So yeah. So the I'm I'm just gonna keep it here and then reference it. Um. That the the at the end of both say v'lo yitin hamashkis labo al batechem lingov. I will not allow the mashkis to enter into the houses to smite, and the mashkis is the shard sorrows. It's the band of of, of bad emissaries, um, and that will be because of the dam hapesa, which is going to protect the rest of the nation. I guess I'm asking about the part where it's like the sun, right? The the dark clouds. Okay, yeah. Let me let me go back to the the pesukim there. Um, uh, that is in Shemos Yud Gimel, um, right? Uh, and it will come to it will be when your son will ask you at some future time, saying, "What is this?" You shall say to him with a strong hand, and uh, Hashem removed us from Egypt uh, from the house of bondage. And it happened when Paro suddenly refused to send us out. Okay, so that's the mida connected mida thing that Paro deserved. That Hashem killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So that's. That's God striking all the firstborns of Egypt as me can mean a punishment for Paro from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I offer to Hashem all male first issue of the womb, and I shall redeem uh, all the firstborn of my sons. Right. So the funny thing, I guess, the problematic word here is the um, alkane, is the alkane, right? What is the causal relationship of the alkane? Because the way Sforno is learning it is the the consecration of the Jewish firstborns was not because of the Makas Bechoros, it was because of the Mashkis that happened on the night of Makas Bechoros. So this does sound a little uh, misleading. Right. Good question. 
<laughs> any any answer? Yeah, the question is tomorrow's pointing out that everything works out according to Smorno, except for the word therefore. Therefore implies that there's some causal relationship between the previous sentence and this sentence. Um, and the previous sentence says, you know, Paro refused to send uh, uh, the Jews out, so God will meet a connected me to do makas horos on his firstborns. Therefore, Hashem sanctifies all Jewish firstborns. Oh, no, 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 I got it. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, all Jewish firstborns. Um, um, and... Uh, and the problem is we're saying that the sanctification of the Jewish firstborns was to save them from the mashkis, not from Machas Bechoros. The answer, and I don't have the full answer, but the answer lies in the fact that this is not just the reason for the pidyon of, um, of the Jewish human beings. It's also the pidyon of the animals of the animals as well. And that's that has to do with, okay, all right, hold on a second. There's a sforno. We got to bring in another sforno. Um, the uh, sforno on pidyon of Chamor. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so it's in the Pesukim that we were just reading. Um, so the way it works is with a, uh, I think this is it. Hold on. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So Vavarta Kol Peter Rechem Ladashem Kol Peter Sheger Behema. I'm just going to use the uh, Nemo Novetsky translation here. Hold on. Um, Okay, yeah. So uh, it says by regular um, uh, before of animals, it says um, you should. Ooh, sorry, you shall transfer to Hashem every breach of the womb and every breach of the offspring of the animals which you will have the males to Hashem, and the breach of every donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Um, for every firstborn of man of your sons, you shall uh, you shall redeem. Okay, and then Mazo, the child asked Mazos, right? So there's three categories of, of firstborn. There's firstborn of a, of a kosher animal, and there's firstborn of a donkey, which you have to axe uh, unless you redeem it. And then there's firstborn of humans. So Sforno here sh says, um, uh, hold on a second. Da, 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 da. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing the one here. Um, okay, he says... Yeah, okay, this is interesting. By he, okay, so uh, sorry, it's going on. By he ki hikshafaro le shalachenu, and when Paro was hard set against us sending us out, by Yaharo Hashem kol bechor beeretz mitraim mibchor adam ba'ad bechor behema. Hashem killed all the firstborns in Egypt from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of animals. Um, al kena nizavech le Hashem kol peter rechem hazacharim bechol bechor benai efde. Uh, therefore, uh, I slaughtered to Hashem every firstborn, uh, every first issue of womb of the males, and every firstborn of my sons I will redeem. Okay, so sworn on that says, since Paro was stubborn uh, to not send us out, okay, and he's compared to a donkey, and that's a fairly common thing, right? Donkeys are stubborn. Uh, and there's actually an open puzzle in Yechazkel that says Egypt is compared to donkeys. I think it's Egypt here. Um, that they're, the flesh of donkeys is their flesh. Is this talking about Egypt? Uh, maybe it's, what was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thus you called to the memory of the lewdness of your youth in the handling of your bosom by the Egyptians of the breasts of your youth. Um, okay. V'haya yacho liftos atzmo v'amo b'shalcho es Yisrael. And Paro could have redeemed himself and uh, his nation by sending out the Jews. Shehim nimshalim l'seh. And the Jews are compared to a sheep. Okay. Ka'amra, as it says, se pezura Yisrael. It says Israel is like a scattered sheep, scattered flock, probably. V'chein ba'amra ve'etna tsoni. Also, it says, I have designated my sheep or I placed my sheep. Therefore, v'yahro g'ashem v'hakel harag es ha'nimsha l'chamor kasher lo nifted b'seh. Therefore, God decrees that you should kill the chamor when it is not redeemed with a seh, when it's not redeemed with a with a, uh, a lamb. Okay, um, so... What is he saying here? He's saying the whole institution of the pidyon um, of the bechor among the animals is designed to remind us of the mita connected mita with Paro. That Paro is like a donkey in his stubbornness to save the Jews, uh, to send out the Jews. He could have redeemed himself and his nation via the seh by sending out the Jewish people, but he didn't. So he got axed. Okay. And that's what you're doing with your animals is that you redeem the seh 
Um, or sorry, you um, you you offer the seder to Hashem completely, okay? Because that's re re reminding you of the Klai Israel component, and then the axing of the donkey is remembering reminding you of the the paro mita connected mita punishment, and then the poor Adam is to remind you of the role of the Jewish Bechoros and the whole idea we said about this for So the Alkin is going on the entire, it's like a mini like demonstration. The institution of the Bechoros is like a mini demonstration of these ideas about the three groups in Yetis Mitzrayim. That worked out nicely. <laughs> See, this, this is what I mean about the Sforno and the detective work. I had prepared this year and I was like, okay, I, I, I want to try to put together all the pieces. And this was like the one piece I couldn't put together. So I didn't incorporate it into the shear of the se and the Hamor. And I just didn't see that problem. But like, it now makes sense. So very good. One last step of the shear, which is a question that I always like to ask. Hold on a second. So summary here is the Sforno's understanding of the Korban Pesach and the Makas Bechoros is on Lil Tesvav, Benis and Benis were subject to shard sorrows. The whole nation was saved through the zechus of the Korban Pesach, but the Bechoros, who were more liable on account of their leadership role, were saved by being sanctified to a Bodhis Hashem. Final question, which I like to ask all the time, so what? Okay, what are the takeaways? You know, um, and I, what I'm picturing, just picture like, you know, fast forward however many months uh, to the, you know, Pesach Seder, right? So you're going to have this vague memory of like something, 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 Bechoros, like, like, uh, you know, <laughs> Sforno, like what, what does, it, does this change my view of like the, the Bechoros or of, of Pesach or whatever? Um, so, uh, you know, there's many answers. I'll just give you one takeaway. So, you know, there's three mitzvos on the night of Pesach, Pesach, Matzah, and Mar. I feel like statistically, if you asked people which mitzvah they have the easiest time relating to, they would say probably like Matzah, because there's a lot of ideas of freedom and you've got the slavery in Mata and the Lekamoni. Maror is the slavery, you know. Pesach people have a hard time relating to because it's related to Korbanos, which we don't do anymore. It's related to a Vodazara. A lot of people don't think about a Vodazara, you know. And it's just, I don't know, it's hard to connect to that, okay. So um, I wanted to just uh, emphasize this point from the Sforno earlier, where he says that the Israelite firstborns were not more deserving of punishment on account of the generation's iniquity since they were the most exalted, and since they didn't deserve to be saved from the plague of the region in the manner of Pentisave Babon Ha'ir. Okay, so I also, oh, sorry, one more problem is that um, I remember when I, I gave this shear, before I gave the shear to the women, I gave it to some of the yeshiva guys, and as I was giving the shear, they said, some guy said to me, said like, you know, you're going to be more interested in this shear because you're a firstborn, you know, and uh, and I after the shear, I told him, I said, doesn't just relate to the firstborns, the court pace relates to everybody, right? And I think I just walked away from this with a greater appreciation of that. And I'm going to tie it to a Targum. Okay. So um, Sforno says uh, in earlier in Shemos Yud Aleph Tess. And again, he says that throughout Sefer Shemos. He says, uh, Hashem said to Moshe, Paro will not listen to you. He says, now God, blessed is he, decreed to punish Egypt and to save Israel from that punishment, since some of them were deserving of this to a certain extent. Um, so in other words, Israel was liable because they partook of the Egyptian society and all of the bad influences of Egypt, and they were liable uh, to a certain extent. And to cast down the Egyptian forces in order that the punishment should take effect, and all of this was through the Pesach offering, as it was stated, I shall pass, I shall strike, I shall enact judgments, I shall skip. Okay, Zevach Pesachu, so that's just emphasizing that Israel was liable because we were like the Egyptians. Zevach Pesachu, this offering was done on account of the skipping over that would happen on the following midnight. And it was necessary for each individual to offer it because a miracle was done for each and every individual, not for the community as a whole. Okay, so the Korban Pesach is an individual uh, phenomenon, right, on, on the households, because each individual had a miracle done for him. So there is, I think, yeah. Yes, because we were all, yeah, because we were all liable, right? Yeah, good. So, Okay, there's a pet peeve of mine, which is people translating um, Pesach as a Passover, right? Um, I, I think skip over is more accurate. So I'll skip over you. Skipping up, Passover is just ambiguous. It can mean, and I know God uses Bavarti, but um, passing through, skipping means like you're going... Um, Boom, 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 and then you skip, right? There's Rashi that says he was going from Mitzri and Mitzri and the, the, the Israelite between God's spirit. But the Targum, though, anyone know how the uh, Targum translated Upasah? Chamati, right. So so Targum says on this Pasuk, What does Achus mean is, I will see the blood and I will have compassion upon you, Okay. Um, I, I, have, I have mercy, okay? Similarly, later on, Hashem skipped over the, the entrance, 
is v'yichus Hashem al Tara. Uh, Hashem will have compassion upon the door. Okay, so I think that this there is this idea that um, that is a relevant theme that we have to think about. You know, with every uh, you know every Pesach, which is that we were no different from the Mitzrim. And Hashem, out of compassion, gave us this ability to differentiate ourselves from them and to be saved. If it was just Midas Adin, we would have been uh, killed along with the rest of the Mitzrim, and we would have been killed like the Mitzrim for the same Hizchibos, you know? So the, the Pesach is a, it's, according to Targum, we call it the mercy offering because it was God giving us this other chance to differentiate ourselves from the Mitzrim and to be spared. And this is not a new idea. Like, I think, you know, we have this idea in general, but I think with a Sfornos shot, you get a clear picture of what would have happened on the night of Makos Bechoros, that all of Israel would have been subject to the same bad stuff that happened to the Mitzrayim, and the Mashis would have killed us as well. It's not just that the Pesach protected us from Makos Bechoros. That kind of dilutes and distorts the whole idea. It was that we were all subject to indiscriminate destruction because we did had no way of discriminating ourselves, and the Korban Pesach was the means of, uh, of doing that. So that's my takeaway is uh, Swarno's commentary highlights the theme of Pesach as divine compassion. We were all liable for destruction on Leil Tezvav, were it not for Hashem's mercy, and that should prompt us on the night of Pesach for additional reflection on <laughs> to what extent we act like Mitzrayim, you know, and not differentiate ourselves from our own society, but also Hoda for the fact that God saved us and gave us this additional uh, means of Rachman. So that's that. And again, just Sforno doesn't let me down. It just like it gives you all the pieces and you just got to keep doing your detective work and then putting together all the, all the things. And, and it's people like the, the, the Ruf Kupman and Elliot Danola and like all Torah search engines that like, they just give you all the pieces that you need to like put together this thing. But it's like, you know, he has a Shita, you know, Sforno has a Shita and it's going to be like a rewarding, satisfying Shita if you like look into it. Yeah, Dave. Right. You know, I don't know. And I saw a thing that uh, in a footnote from Ruf Kuberman saying, don't think that Henti um, Saveba Avon Ha'ir applied to the Behema because Behemos don't have Bechira and Penti Saveba Avon Ha'ir is an ownership that comes about through Bechira. So there's something going on there. Oh. Right. Only the Bechoros of the. Yeah, right, right. So I don't know uh, how or why they were targeted. My my intuition, which is not from Sforno, it's from other stuff, is that um, it had to do with the Egyptian theology, something about the theology or or striking the Elohim Mitzrayim and the role that firstborn animals played then. But that's just, I have no basis for that intuition. Um, and since it was a campaign against the Egyptian um, of Odazara, which was of a primary thing, then he could target the firstborn animals as objects of the Hashgacha, not as subjects, and to demonstrate certain ideas to Paro. But this is kind of related to David's question as well. Like, I, I don't feel like I have a full grasp on how God killing all of Paro's firstborn humans and animals was Mita Kinega Mita against Paro for refusing to send out the firstborns. I feel like there's some some more idea to get there. Yeah. And you had a second question? Yeah. It seems like specifically called out named John Mike. It's like Doesn't like the shark saw the fact that other and die like there's a big secondary plague that would have wiped out right like climate specific don't call that out at all here yeah 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 i mean here with the with which part with Marcus, oh, I think by every Marcus, right oh yeah yeah right here like yeah it's just alluded to right yeah I, that's another thing that bothers me about the you know, again, it's the, the Balha Haggadah apparently is drawing our attention to this dever that crept along with everything you know um and the ancient Mice and Sha mace is um uh is right is is alluding to this and the mashkis is also talking about it, but it's, yeah it's not explicit yeah strange yeah um the one question is the second but if well if there was this ever on all the markets yeah I don't mean, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering as well. And if this was actual contagion, an actual epidemic, then I think it stands to reason, even though I don't get this from the Sforno, that it was just building in intensity or in severity in the nation throughout the entire you know um, time period of all the Makos, and it reached this culmination point here. I think that you, we really would have to do is look into the whole sugya of that accompanying Dever, you know, which again, I wrote an article about it, but it was a long time ago and not in light of this. And I, I feel like there's a lot more to, to look into there. Yeah, yeah. And and this, you know, this, there's that whole machlok is about which um, 
you know, which Makos were B'nai Israel subject to. You know, you have the Chazal's position, which is that they were protected from everything. And then you have the Ibn Ezra's position, which is only the ones that the Torah says that they were protected from, they were protected from. Um, and I think this is going to have <laughs> certainly going to do different answers here as well. Yeah. Yeah. Does it say anywhere the last of the nation separated the first people from the Torah of Israel and the Torah of Israel? In the Psukim, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't find it either. And on, by the way, that, this is the, the fun part now about when you have this. It's like this fun experience of reading through all the Psukim and be like, wait a minute, can I like can I find either Raya or disproof or like you know, or like it, it changes it? So I, I gotta be on the lookout, but I, I can't remember. I think it's just that Chazal of like God is mocking being Tipa shall before and Tipa Shana shall before. But it's not like Basamti produced being Ami of in Amecha type. Yeah, right. I, I don't recall one. Yeah, I don't recall one. Yeah. Right. That's the closest you get, right? Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, David? Yeah, just in terms of the me, the connecting me, that could be yeah. going back to what we discussed before that um, Hashem is saying, Paro, release my nation because they're the, the ones who will perpetuate my values. And if you refuse to mm. do so, I'm going to wipe out your Bechoros okay. because who would who you would hope to perpetuate your values. Right. That's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good media connected media, especially because it ties it to the Chait Mitzrayim of the Avodah Zara. The, the Chait Mitzrayim was the Avodah Zara and the ramifications of that in how you treat other human beings, right? The enslavement and all that as, as well. And you can see the Bechoros being tied up in that. I did look, by the way, into what, um, uh, in the, there's that, you know, another book I recommend is the Koran Tanakh of the Land of Israel, which brings in all of the archaeological findings, but it's an orthodox production. So they have like all the stuff that, that fleshes out all the, you know, Egyptology and stuff. So I looked to see if I could find what the role of the Bechoros was in Mitzrayim, but I, I forgot to look. On, I was looking on Chavez, forgot to look online that we, we should see what it, what we know about the roles of the Bechoros in Mitzrayim. Um, and then I think that would, you know, hopefully find support for your theory. Yeah, Moshe? Well, this actually ties back to a point Paro raised. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what his question was, but it's about the leaders being responsible. That's yeah. The idea of Kola Kola Kula. Right. That, um, and the Chazal said that if you see a failure of a generation, you have to look to the leaders. So, right. So it's not that's true. specifically for the Kola. That's just any Right, meaning... And even our generation today. Yeah, meaning whatever these sins are that Kala Yisrael was involved in, of Odazara, and I don't know if he holds that there was a, like some sort of like a Rios component, um, the Bechoros should have stopped or educated, you know, the uh, nation. My question was more nuanced, like, what exactly is the need of the Bechoros such that they won't come to, to this issue? Oh, no. So I think it's not a Mida. It's the fact that they were de facto in leadership positions. Yeah, but you don't just see it here. I, I, I just think, I mean, it, it can't be that they're always just, you know, um, no, no, th th that's how the society was structured. It would be like saying here, like if you said, for example, like why do fathers, why are they more subject to the bad media of not doing a, a, a good job, like imparting values to their kids? It's not that they have a bad media. It's that they are, we're in a patriarchal society where like there is a head of household, you know, and, and fathers do set the tone in the household. And that's just how the way the society is structured. So in Mitzrayim, it was a before centric society. Yeah. I that. Yeah, did. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. And it's also it's funny because that's also a phenomenon. You know, Dave said um that there's Lo Yacharat Kalev Lashano, um on the night um of Mahas Bakoros that no dog will bark at them. That's also funny because that's also like a, it's it's a side phenomenon, you know? Yeah. It's a riot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the riot is like, you see what's Jacob Lady. Yeah. And they were the ones who, you know, who are, who are now zelda to be, you know, in the event of Yeah. But you see, they never had an issue after they, you know, they got in. You see, with the performance, we had like an issue. Right. Yeah. I mean, Shev Levi has had its own positive qualities as well. My, my and again, this is my guess is that that the reason why God chose the Bechoros to do the Avoda was that's just how the ancient world was. 
right? It was the Bukhara. I mean, Yaakov, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's why you have to take the Bukhara, Bukhara from Asaph. It was not merit uh, meritocracy. It was just the 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 responsibility went to the Bukharos. Whereas, like, whereas the Levim was a new system. That was choosing which Shevet demonstrated a dedication to God in Fait HaEgel or was, you know, part of the Masora of, like, learning in charge of that. That was, that was different. And, and so, Yaakov mentioned that Ruben would have gotten it if he didn't sin. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that would have been a natural... To me, that to me that leads to more of a meetup issue than just because you. No, but the role in society, which what it shows you, is the role in society before was was supposed to be the leader. No, I uh, that I agree with. But the question of like, right. the right. value of leadership, like right. I don't mean about it to be ten different things, but it seems like as a whole, the leadership is better. Yeah, this is something right. So one last question here that someone posted in the chat. How would Sforno address the issue of the complete destruction of Klai Yisrael had they not performed the Korban Pesach, considering their low level, and the Shlichus of Moshe and the Haftacha to the Avos uh, of Geula? I, I think that's just the same question in general. At one point, Hashem says, I'm going to destroy all of Klai Yisrael, make a new nation out of Moshe. You know, Hashem probably would have gotten Moshe out of it, uh, out and like worked it out. You know, uh, I don't know what he says specifically about that, but you know, there's, uh, you know, there's not the only time that God was going to destroy all of Klai Yisrael, unfortunately. Okay, thank you for coming. And for helping uh, develop this year. Yeah.